I'm Eric Christian Olson. I am representing the EMA, which is the Environmental Media Association, where I am on one of the advisory boards, the parental advisory board with my wife, Sarah. And we are having a series of conversations with some amazing scientists, uh, Dr. Aaron Bernstein, uh, Chris Golden, who I am now dating. Uh, we're going on a honeymoon back to Madagascar, where we'll be taking pictures in our tent, feeding lemurs. Lemurs, which are like lemurs, but with a fancy accent. Um, and today we have the opportunity to talk to Francesca Dominici, who is an Italian professor of biostatistics at Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health, co-director of data science initiative at Harvard University. She was recruited to the Harvard Chan School as a tenured professor uh, in biostatistics in 2009. She was appointed the Associate Dean of Information and Technology in 2011 and Senior Associate Dean for Research in 2013. Her research focuses on the development of statistical methods for the analysis of large and complex data, which essentially is what I did in Beer Fest. It's a great movie, you should see it, documentary on drinking beer in Germany. She has published more than 200 peer-reviewed publications. She was recognized in the Thomson Reuters 2019 list of the most highly cited researchers, ranking in the top 1% of the cited scientists in her field. Uh, she is the senior author of a recently published article, COVID-19 and PM 2.5, uh, which is an explosive uh, article that we're going to talk about. But one of the things that's so fantastic about these conversations is my background um, in TV and film and literature, my dad's an English professor, so much of my understanding of really complex problems and situations comes from understanding the human element. Um, so if you look at something as macro as the Holocaust, well, I remember when I was first reading about the Holocaust and looking at the numbers and looking at the data, it was overwhelming. And the way that I understood um, that macro information was through the singular story of um, William Styron Sophie's Choice. And once I found that way into the data, I understood the human element and therefore was able to digest all these massive catastrophic uh, information. Uh, we are doing a very similar thing, I think, with science, which is that when you look at the data, sometimes it's overwhelming. When you look at the science, it's hard to process. And so we're entering these conversations, looking not only at the science, but the scientists and looking for the human entry point, which is the perfect segue to talk to uh, Francesca uh, about her origin story uh, before we get into the article about where she's from and why she's so interested in this topic and how she got into it. Well, thank you, so, thank you. You're very generous. And I always get like, kind of like, you know, embarrassed by now on all of these words. But yeah, so uh, my background, my background is actually pretty, I'd say, unusual because I uh, grew up from, I would say, the ghetto of Rome, Italy. Wow. And um, when I was 24, I always had this passion about learning more about mathematical, mathematics and statistics to do important things. And so, again, sold the advice of my family where I was supposed to marry an airplane pilot. I decided to leave the airplane pilot. By the way, it was a really cool airplane pilot. Uh, but anyway, I, I dumped him. And I went to Durham, North Carolina, a Duke, and this was 1997, with my Italian suit, my scarf. Yeah, girl. And not speaking a single word of English and starting life. Uh, basically, I, I took the most theoretical classes because if the class was taught in English, I will not understand anything. So more mathematical oriented, the more probability, the better. And um, yeah, I finished my Italian PhD at Duke University, and then I found a job at Hopkins, and then, you know, and then here I am. I never came back to, to Italy. But, you know, I really came from with no money. I never spent a single dime in education. I never studied English. I never studied epidemiology. So anyway, I really, no one in my family has a college degree. And I just, you know, made it up basically but this is also i think what's good about this country that they allow me the only thing i wanted to do is study um and so i always had this this really passion of um, using mathematics and statistics to solve important problems and make the world a better place 
And I got actually really lucky because when I started this, the statistician was actually the, you know, not a sexy job at all. I mean, you know, it was like the nerdy, I mean, you know, like I was trying, when I was trying to, to date in the U.S., I would say I'm a statistician. They were like, Ugh. it's like, you know, it's like oh, there's nothing to talk about. But then, you know, um, now with all of this data, yeah. hey, I am a data scientist. Yeah, you're, you know? you're the hot ticket. I'm like, oh God, you know, I can tell you anything you want. So, you know, it was actually, I think, because of the technology, I think our job got better. But also I have to say, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, you know, with, uh, with the ability of accessing data, analyzing data comes also an enormous amount of responsibility. And so, you know, I've been uh, um, thinking about that a lot and always, you know, oh, now data is actual power. Data is money. Yep. Data is everything. Yep. And so, you know, I'm like sitting on these, you know, amount of data with all tools and I feel a tremendous amount of obligation in making a good use of it. But that's not always so easy, uh, especially, you know, at this time. Yeah, yeah, especially at this time, which is what we, we, what we hinted at. Um, so that's so interesting in the poor side of Rome. Um, and so much of your studies now are reflecting what it's, how difficult that is and how air pollution affects these poor sections of, across the globe. Yes, and I've always been very interested about generally exposure because, so I grew up in this little town called Ciampino. So if you fly into Rome, you fly in this in the largest airport, the Fiumicino Airport, but there is a second airport which is called Ciampino that you don't go there unless you take like small flights. And you know, my house, can you believe it was two kilometers from the airport? So think about the noise and the gasoline. Oh, the pollution. Yeah, I'm coming from the ghetto. And I've always been wondering through entire, my entire career, I published many years ago an important study on noise exposure from airplane and cardiovascular disease. So I've always been wondering about, you know, living in these communities, what, you know, how does it affect, um, how does it affect health? Well, that fully, I mean, that first off, this is the, the, the global dream, not just the American dream, but to, to come from there uh, bootstrap story to boot yourself in college to study and get deep into the science and then to have um, from an emotional standpoint so much of what you're studying coming from what it is that you lived as a kid like right. that's that's amazing that's and now you're solving the problems in which you see you you know as these kids grow up in, in these uh, these poverty stricken parts of the world and how do we help them like that's right. this is this is the hero's journey like this is the stuff we talk about like you're doing it that's amazing well try i mean clearly the the, the the intention is there it's also important to train the student to, to really think about with empathy and humility and think about these issues and you know especially at harvard as well right that's it to think about these issues with with empathy i mean that's that's the key to so much of this and especially when translating science and data into policy is what the role of empathy plays in that. That is the human element that we keep talking about. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's amazing. And you have a, uh, a two-year-old black lab named Tilly. Yes. And I'm getting, <laughs> eh, yes, it's just my love. And I'm getting another one. I'm getting another You're, puppy. Are, are you getting a COVID puppy? You're adopting a puppy during COVID? I've wanted so badly to get another uh, dog during COVID, but we have two kids. My wife is pregnant and we have one giant English Mastiff. So my wife is just like, you really want to add another creature to this? And I was like, yes, is that the wrong answer? Um, so talk to, me about, talk, talk to me about this study, because this is something that I cited when talking to Aaron Bernstein, you know, four weeks ago, when it, I think it had first come out and I read the article in the New York Times, and then when they said we have the opportunity to talk to you, I was so blown away because I'd already read kind of that first linking article and went to that study. Um, how do you want to introduce uh, what the study is, kind of boilerplate and, 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 and walk us through it? Yeah, sure. So first of all, we need to get the facts right because the study is not published yet, which okay. is why I got highly criticized and we can talk about that. The pub, so I mean... The, the New York Times wrote about it, but the, the paper is currently under peer review. And, right. you know, if you know a little bit, you know, peer review is the equivalent of being criticized and creamed for quite some time. 
Right. So we are waiting to, you know, formally publish in a peer review. But um, so here is how we, how we came up. It's actually in a certain way. It's an it's an interesting. So I, you know, I publish many 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 study on the effects of our pollution on health in in the United States. So we gathered giant amount of data. I mean, I'm talking about 560 million records and link, I mean, you know, huge, huge data. And we estimate the facts of breathing polluted hair on increasing the risk of mortality in the elderly in America. And this was a study that I published three years ago. So it was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine and got a lot of attention. It now has been used to uh, advocate for lowering the national ambient air quality standard for fine particulate matter. So myself and my really wonderful team of student and postdoctoral fellow, we have been really gathering this giant amount of data. I mean, we basically have, you know, if you, if you are in a US citizen and you are enrolling Medicare, I have your health record. I yep. cannot recognize by name, but I have you. Right. So you yep. are yep. my data point. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so anyway, so we know all about that. And then when the COVID exploded, um, you know, there was, I think me and my, all of my colleagues that are in the public health area, you know, we were so frustrated because we were thinking, oh my God, everything's shut down. We need to help, we need to help. How do we help? What can we do, right? And then I started thinking that we learned that COVID, COVID is really kills you often, most of the time, by creating a form of, by causing a form of viral pneumonia. Yep. And so um, among the many studies that we did, we did, you know, in addition of the fact of PM 2.5 on our health system, we also studied the fact of PM 2.5 on a similar type of pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a very bad disease. So I start making that connection and then I start thinking that, you know, all of the diseases that they are affected by breathing polluted hair are all of the diseases that were becoming this critical condition for making patients that had COVID even sicker. Yep. And so, um, so then I realized that we actually have all of the data platform because we have data on levels of, of pollution in the air for one kilometer, one kilometer grid for all the United States for the last 20 years. And we have all data about socioeconomic status. I mean, we have tons of data. And so when I realized that COVID-19 data were publicly available, I sent an email to my team. I said, hey guys, we have to do a study. We need to look at this. We can quickly link the data and see whether or not there is a relationship between historical exposure to fine particulate matter and increased risk of death if you contract the virus. And you know, our hypothesis, both from the biologic and clinical perspective, was that if you live in an area that you have been breathing polluted hair for a very long time, then you, your lungs, we know that, we know that your lungs are already inflamed. So if you get COVID, it's gonna get even worse. Right. So then at the same time, I was actually talking, so my, my family, I'm from Rome, so I'm from the ghetto of Rome, but they, my, my husband, who is also Italian, he's from much higher level socioeconomic status from Milan, so they're much fancier. But every time we go to Italy, you know, the past years, you know, I am, I am a, long, a long distance runner. And every time I will go running outside Milan, I couldn't breathe because the pollution was so bad, where if I go run outside Rome, it's perfectly fine. And so at the same time, I will see all of these terrible news from Italy that, you know, we were much more concerned of our family in Milan than the family in, in Rome. And so that also comes back like really personal to me because yep. I, I bred, I mean, I, many times I was exposed to the horrible polluted hair in the north of Italy. 
And so anyway, that's how it started. And so, you know, I have an amazing team of kids that, you know, they were like, sure, let's look at. So we linked the data and this was data for over 3000 counties, just so over 97% of the population. And then we have to collect many additional variables like confounding factor, because you cannot only see, you know, if, if you see that a county has a high pollution and a high COVID rate, you can't say that it's pollution that lead to the COVID mortality. It could be that it's because that county has a lot of population density or has a yep. lot of smoke, right? So we yep. have to account for many, many other variables. So we developed statistical models. I mean, you know, these statistical models, I mean, we didn't invent a new methodology, but the statistical analysis in a certain ways, it's a little sophisticated because you had a lot of counties that still didn't have any case. You have data that are correlated in space, you know. So, um, and then we found a link. We found a relationship. So then here is my dilemma, which to be honest with you, this is why we have this open conversation. I don't know whether or not I made the right decision. I, I, I tell you what the decision I made, right? So now I'm sitting on the largest Harvard data on PM and COVID mortality. I found the relationship. I know that people around the world are dying for COVID and I have two choices. I can send my paper for peer review and wait three to six months, maybe more, or call the New York Times and said, this is a preliminary study and I'm worried that based on the data that we are seeing, this is preliminary data, Data on the website, everything is reproducible. So any dude that they want to see exactly what we do, they can do it themselves. I'm worried, I'm worried that you guys have to look at communities that are breathing high polluted hair, because even if my numbers are wrong, to me it's common sense right. that people that live in community that, that breathe polluted hair. They're gonna have asthma, they're gonna have COPD, they're gonna be poor, they're gonna be of color. So then if they get the virus, you know, they're, they're gonna be high risk. So I did it, I call it, I did it, they went on it. And honestly, it was boom. I mean, all over the world, it was insane. And, you know, um, I don't know, because I think many people are, I fe so my, from my viewpoint was advising people and advising the government that we should be worried about polluted hair and advising and saying that this is not the time to relax environmental regulation. Right. I think it's, it was the right thing to do, right? But on the other hand, you know, many people got upset because they said, well, you know, this study has not been published yet and she should have not, they should have not talked about it until, you know, it would have been peer reviewed. And so, you know, that's, you know, I decided to do that. I decided yeah. to take the risk. Um, whether or not it was the right call, I think time will say. I think there are, you know, um, I put my reputation at risk. Um, I've been criticized and of course, consultant of the oil industry, right. now they're like, oh my God, we can trash this study before it gets published, <laughs> right? And so, um, of course, now this study has a lot of limitation. And the main limitation is that the data available on COVID is only available at the aggregated level of the county. So all of the other studies, we were able to have individual level records. We know the person, we know the person where he lives, we know the age, gender, right? But COVID data is not available at the individual level. So that really, you know, um, doesn't allow us to make strong statement because it is only available at the data level. But on the other hand, there is nothing we could do. I mean, currently that's all the data that we have. And I think in a time of a pandemic, this is what goes back to the amble. We are never going to get the best data because, you know, this is a pandemic. Things happen, happen fast. Fluid. So, Everything's fluid. So we are not in the situation where, say, I'm going to design a study where 
pandemic is gonna start on January 1 and I'm gonna make sure to fall, you know, it doesn't work that way. So the, the research protocol, which we like to control in the general setting, goes out the window in a pandemic. The, you know, this is, this is what it is. So anyway, but that's, that's a study. The study found that if you take two counties, they are as similar as possible with respect to demographic, people that smoke, when the pandemic starts, but one has a slightly higher level of pollution historically than the other. The people that live in more polluted counties have a higher mortality rate for COVID up to 8%, which is, you know, a significant number. I mean, to me, listen, this is a perfect conversation to have right now because it really is the intersection of what is deeply um, political uh, and kind of the war on science, right? So if we look at research prior to COVID, we know this particulate matter, um, it affects lung disease, right? Cardiovascular health. Um, and we know that soot, right? So let's, let's go back even further. Particulate matter is, so that's the pollutants coming out of coal power plants, right? Auto industry, um, uh, ga greenhouse gas emissions, which is also the number one contributor, right? To greenhouse gas emissions yep. is the coal industry. Um, what, what are the other, uh, list the other things under particulate matter, just so we have an understanding. Of so uh, coal fire power plants, general right. power plants, traffic, traffic. Uh, airplane, um, some dust, anything that you burn, wildfires, right. uh, but all, of, all, of, all of industrial activities that they, in order to get their energy, they burn, that cause fine particular matter. Right, so we know that stuff has an effect on, on the, the human health, right? That affects human health. I mean, if you look back at Nixon, in 1970, he passed the Clean Air Act because right. he saw the science and the data showed that if it was over 2.5, the people were gonna die. And so he said, all right, here's the Clean Air Act, and we saw those numbers decline, and in doing so, that was public health. So you have an opportunity uh, in real time, in a fluid situation, during a pandemic, to bring science to the table, to have a conversation saying, you know, not only is population density a situation, not only is it affecting poverty, but we're also seeing that these particulate matter above 2.5 can affect it up to 8%. I would argue in that situation, you have a responsibility to submit to New York Times to say, hey, this hasn't been peer reviewed. We're sending it to, where does it go? Uh, journal, uh, well, we're not going to say, we're not going to say. Because, You're going to send it someplace. Well, it is someplace, but okay. I'm not going to send because I don't want the critics to start dashing the journal against us. Right. Okay. So that, right. A preemptive strike, because that is when we talk about the Environmental Protection Agency, who's one of the, Scott Pruitt, um, and now what's his name? Um, Uni Blake? Uh, Wheeler is now the... Um, but the, who, who's uh, the public health toxologist of the American Petroleum Institute, oil and gas lobby? Oh, Institute. yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So these guys are the guys that are fighting against it. They're the ones that are putting this in their in their in their jowls like pit bulls and arguing against it. And their argument essentially is the preservation of economics. It's not about public health. It's about how do we preserve our way of life and continue to have these industries make money because so much of these groups working for the EPA are working for as lobbyists for the the, the gas and oil administration. So you know, listen, I know nothing, but I know in that situation. The science leading up to this moment, knowing what damage it does to lungs, knowing what damage it does to the body, this is an opportunity to blow the whistle and say, hey, this is this first study. We have an opportunity to talk about this and put it on the table. And it's not so much like, hey, let's take the science and talk about what the next move is. So much of this administration is about fighting the science itself, which I think is a terrifying place to be in, you know, as a person that... The other thing is, you know, I mean, again, you know, you have no idea how much I've been thinking about that. And I never, you know, um, I wrote, I wrote 220 peer review papers. So I know right. how peer reviews worked. And, uh, you know, when I was thinking about back and thinking, well, you know, 
compared to making, I mean, there are senators and making action about me. People are dying. So, yep. you know, compared to they're going to criticize me, well, who cares? See, I mean, you know, they can, and the funniest thing is when we wrote the paper, we published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is, it was a study in 2017. Listen to this, 60 million American published in New England Journal of Medicine with an editorial by the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine say we need to lower the national ambient air quality standard. I got creamed also. Right, right. <laughs> so it's not that if you publish the a first, you're not going to get creamed. I mean, you have no idea there were letters of accusing me of misconduct, you know, to the province, right? So this is the level of attack that, you know, we are getting. And again, I mean, I think that, you know, um, the question is, should we rely on a single study to make multiple policy, you know, important policy decision? So that's a good question. Of course not. Right. But as you pointed out, the science about fine particular matter. Yes. Oh my God. We're talking about thousands of studies. Yes. And so, um, you know, honestly, I sometimes I feel embarrassed that you don't need an ARVA study to tell you that at the time of a pandemic that attacks your lungs, you want to allow everyone, everyone to breathe cleaner hair, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, this is a responsible and wise thing to do instead of fighting, you know, a single study and... But yeah, it's hard. Well, it's that, that they, they fight it because it's in, it's not in their economic interest. I do, I do, because here's another example of that study. So 2003, Dr. Zhu Feng Zhang, which is, they did a study on SARS patients in the most polluted parts of China were twice as likely to die from the disease as in places with low air pollution, twice as likely to die of disease. So there's another example in which we look at the pollutants in the air, we talk about a disease that gets into the lungs, and we say, what are the results based on air pollution? I think that's pretty conclusive evidence that, you know, we have a case uh, that argues that so much of what we've seen in these pollutants are really harmful. Um, there, so are now, there are now studies of similar as mine in Italy, in China, in the Netherlands, in England, in India. Uh, so, yeah. How do you, so here's the question. If you talk about that pollution soup um, that is particulate matter, when they do legislation against it, they don't do the whole thing. So they have to separate it into obviously to separate specific pollutants, yes? Well, no, they, so they, the current discussion is about whether or not to lower the national ambient air quality standard of PM 2.5. So PM 2.5 of particular matter of a diameter lower than 2.5 micron. So the EPA and the Cleaner Act ask the EPA to make regulation for independent pollutants. These are primary pollutants. So the, the right. pollutants under discussion, which, which is the pollutant that we have studied, is PM 2.5. Now, okay. you might want to study, it's true that PM 2.5 is a soup of many chemical components. And it's also really important to figure out which of the, the chemical components in the soup are most harmful. So then right. you can better target, you know, is it really the coal fire plants or is it still really the traffic, right? But that's, to be honest with you, we have been trying to do that for years. And that is a very hard, the data even though we like to say we have all of the data in the world, the data on the chemical composition of fine particulate matter, I don't think is at the level of granularity that we need to be able to disentangle what in the soup it's really, you know, bad for you. Right, right. So, you know, and one of the things, these conversations are so, um, from an individual standpoint, like we seem powerless in this battle that's happening between environmental protection agency and scientists um, in, a, in a government that's, that's so hamstrung. On an individual level, what can we be doing? Yeah, no, it's-, it's Or a state it's, or, or an individual and then let's go state. Yeah, I mean, I think from, from an individual level, I think there are many choices that you can do on a day by day that basically less energy 
you use more you are trying to contribute to the cause of you know less pollution you know less car less electricity you know recycling anything that you know that allow us to use less energy less meat you know there is all like the relationship between meat and greenhouse gases so there is there is a lot of of a personal responsible choice which basically less we rely on energy more we support the cause but i do think that the most important battle to be honest with you is that we have the right government in place right. Uh, I think, you know, even though I don't have the expertise to, to talk about the economic benefit of moving to a less, you know, less coal, I do know that the argument that we need to rely on coal because we need to save jobs doesn't exist. So I think that we need to vote the right people, we need to support the right people, but then they can bring this, this discussion forward because even even as a scientist, it's amazing. Like you know, you can I can publish in the top journal in the world, but they have they they fire all of the scientists. I saw that. EPA. So you know, it's like it's, um, it's a, yeah. That's it's what a I mean by powerless. Like that's so infuriating. But that's what I wanted you to lead to, which is like obviously we can make you know, using less energy is a big deal, and, and but it's really coming down to what your vote stands for in November. Exactly. Because it, yeah, so much of this. Um, I know that your area of expertise is outdoor particular matter, but I read that article in the New Yorker that talked about indoor particular matter and the highest day of the year, uh, as far as those contaminants being as bad as, you know, uh, living in the slums of New Delhi during Thanksgiving. <laughs> It was the craziest thing I've ever read. So the, it was like 325. What was that number for, for uh, uh, can you tell us why that is? Well, so in full, in full disclosure, this is not a study I did. It was just a I know, study. but it was in the New Yorker. Yeah, so this was a study I had the honor to comment on it. And I, yes. was, I was shocked, but on the other hand, that makes perfect sense. So basically, you know, but also they, they, these make you think of why we really have a huge problem in developing country, right? So, so here is what the study, if my recollection. So basically on Thanksgiving, uh, well, if you are in a cold place, maybe, you know, in California, no, but Northeast, cold Thanksgiving, everybody's inside the house, all of the windows are closed, and there is cooking, 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 going on for 48 hours, right? With the turkey and everything. Well, indoor cooking, increase the level of fine particulate matter and so basically what the study found that on thanksgiving day the, the indoor level of fine particulate matter can be higher than 320 microgram per cubic meter which was really shocking right now but now let's think for a moment that there are places in developing country yep like in india they rely every single day on indoor cooking and they don't right. have so they cook indoor by burning. Mm. So here is now also you think about for a moment that, you know, in that case, it, it tells you how high it can be, but for us it's one day. But in this right. country, this is also why you see this tremendous death toll for PM 2.5, because they are relying on burning inside the house every single day to, to eat. That's crazy. So you're looking at, you know, deep poverty, super high population density, cooking inside, industrial pollutants. It's, I mean, it's, when we think about what's happening, you know, in, in the States with medicine and where it is and having these active conversations, you think about some of these slums in India and it's just horrifying to, to think about what those numbers are going to come out to be. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Um, okay. Uh, anything else you want to discuss? I know we were supposed to be 30 minutes and I know we're, we've blown past that. <laughs> no, I think, well, I think, uh, no, I think we're happy with what we have. I think we have some good material. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can go forever, but I think this is good. Um, well, let's see if Asher or Sky, anybody has anything that we want to yeah. touch on before we jump off. If you guys can jump on and make sure there's anything that we haven't missed. Because I have, I, I mean, I can Hi, talk guys. about it. Hi. Um, I, hi, how's it going? 
I'm making a little guest appearance on this on Asher. Um, uh, let's see. I mean, I would just say sort of uh, any closing thoughts, you know, to, to round to round it out, you know, yeah. um, about you know where we are, where we're going, um, you know, those sort of things. Uh, okay, I'm I'm jumping off. That's a good point. So maybe we just talk. Maybe I I digest this. One of the things that I always try to do is talk about science in a way that I can explain to my six-year-old. I have this, my son's name is Wyatt, and he asks the most amazing questions because I think that at the age of six and seven years old, we don't understand what fear or shame is. And so we ask questions coming from these really innocent places where we don't, we don't care if we look bad. And so when taking something this complex, how do I digest it and, and, and articulate that to my six-year-old, which essentially is there's all these pollutants in the air and when the more pollutants in the air, uh, when it gets above the particulate matter, which is the level of pollutants of, of from, from coal burning power plants, from autos, um, from all the things that we talked about, um, that leads to when somebody gets COVID, they have up to an 8% chance uh, higher uh, of death, death because of the complications of those pollutants already in their lungs. Um, and that's a terrifying realization uh, and a call to action uh, for us as individuals, but also as a state uh, and the federal government and us in November to vote uh, behind people that believe in the science that informs policy, that changes policy and allows our kids, my six-year-old, my three-year-old, my soon-to-be, you know, born baby, um, to live in a world that isn't so um terrifyingly polluted uh that leads to all these um uh possible risk for death when we have situations like a pandemic of of covid or sars or just lung disease and asthma and and heart conditions does that track what did i lose everybody i'm here oh, no oh um so uh does that does that track is that a way to explain that to my six-year-old it's okay with me <laughs> so, good. what's what's next for you besides giving dashing uh conversations and interviews wearing that scarf what's what's next for you well first of all you know i wanted to say that i don't feel even even if sometimes i do feel powerless most of the time i don't feel powerless because i do have a big trust on science and the power of the data so even if governments, even, you know, if the current government doesn't, you know, take the suggestion from science, government change, you know, administration change, solid science stay, and scientists are really good that we don't forget what's, what's a solid science. And so for me, it's really more, more work and more doing better. So I think that we really want to figure out who are the the people in the subpopulation in the United States that are more high risk for pollution uh, and for COVID related disease to our pollution. We are working with actually public health agency and senators to make sure that there are air pollution regulation in place in the most poorest air in the country because, and you know, that's called environmental justice because unfortunately yeah. what happened is you know, so I am talking to you in my nice house in Cambridge, Massachusetts, yeah. very privileged position. And if someone tried to open and install in power plants here, it's not going to work. No, <laughs> right. So where are they going to put the power plant? They're going to put a power plant in Chelsea or they're going to put a power plant in Brockton. And so we really have to change that. And I found really, I found the personal responsibility to fight that. So data and science, even though you, we get criticized and cream, stay. And I think it goes a long, long way. So I'm, I'm happy for the work I do. I will continue to do that. It's the best. You're, as I said before, you are living the hero's journey as far as your origin story, what it is you grew up in, and now what it is you're doing to change the world. And I think that perfectly sums it up, which is that governments change, science uh, remains the same. You know what I mean? The, the, the data is there. And I always look at failure um, as an opportunity to, to move in a different direction, right? And I think there is something so catastrophic 
about this failure that really allows hopefully us to unify, you know, in at least 60% of us to unify and say, we want better. We want better for us. We want better for our kids and we want better for the people that can't fight for themselves. Um, so I, I think that is a really um, optimistic view for the future and makes me excited. And that's why, you know, at the, at the EMA, we're, we're so deeply um, invested in the science and the numbers because that's, that's the hope for the future is we take a look at the science and the data and we make the changes necessary to give everybody a fighting chance to live the best version of their lives. And that's what you're doing. Beautiful. Well, thank you. <laughs> I think that's it. I think you were amazing. <laughs> thank you. I need to call you next time and an industry consultant try to trash me. I'll pick up the phone. And call